When we think of dangerous, ruthless criminals, most of us probably picture men. But what if I told you that some of the most dangerous narcos in South America have been women? As one of the few women to access the highest levels of the cartel underworld, the life of Mexico's most legendary female narco is the stuff of legends. Photos of her party life might resemble an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, except if you were to scan those photos every few years, you would find another character had been murdered. She, however, seemed invincible. Hey y'all, I'm Christina and you're listening to History and Hearsay. In my last few episodes, we've been talking about some pretty inspiring people. But for the next few episodes, we're going to be delving into the dark and mysterious and talking about some bad guys. Or gals. Everything in today's video is alleged as the subject of today's video has not been convicted of most of the crimes that we'll be talking about. And also, I'd like to apologize in advance for the many mispronunciations that are probably coming in this video. I mean no disrespect to anyone, I just don't speak Spanish, and when it comes to pronouncing names, I'm literally the worst. Sandra Avila Beltran was born October 16, 1960, in the Mexican state of Baja, California. It seems that she never really had a chance at a normal life, as she was practically born into the Sinaloa cartel. Her mother's family was notorious drug smugglers, and her father, Alfonso Avila Quintero, was the brother of the Guadalajara cartel leader, Rafael Quintero. She also gained notoriety as the niece of the godfather of Mexican drug smuggling, Miguel Angel Felix Garladolo, who is currently serving a 40-year sentence for trafficking and for the 1985 murder of a U.S. drug enforcement agent. As a result of being a member of this type of family, Sandra grew up surrounded by violence. And by the age of 13, she had witnessed her first mass shootout. We often see the glamorous side of organized crime displayed by Hollywood, but they don't always show the full reality of being in fear for your life on a daily basis and watching people that you love being murdered. Not to mention that a lot of the young people who work for these cartels are the ones who do most of their dirty work, yet they live in poverty and many of them don't even live past their early 20s. I'll link some videos for you guys that I've done of some of the less fortunate ones. In the world of organized crime, it's really only the top dogs and their immediate families who get to live like kings in luxury villas with all of the amazing things you see on TV. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, Sandra grew up in one of those top dog kind of families. She lived a life full of luxury. She attended a private school, she had piano and dance lessons, and she even went to SeaWorld and Disneyland on a regular basis. Her family's lifestyle also included piles of money. They literally had piles of money just sitting around their house. As a child, Sandra would often sit and count money for her father. And when she was just 13, he made her the official money counter for the cartel. Sandra spent so many hours counting cash as a child that when she was an adult, she could actually just swipe up a pile of cash and precisely calculate how much she was holding. By the age of 17, Many of Sandra's childhood friends were beginning to become leaders in the Sinaloa cartel, but Sandra wanted to explore other routes, so she enrolled in journalism classes at a prestigious university. I was actually going to guess accounting, but... No, apparently she wanted to be an investigative reporter. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe Sandra thought that if she got a degree, then maybe she would be able to leave the cartel lifestyle behind. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. But I guess we'll never really know the answer to that question because three years into her communication study, she was kidnapped by a jealous boyfriend who had powerful connections to the cartel. And nobody really seems to know why he kidnapped her or how long he kept her, but it seems as though this event completely changed the trajectory of her life. Maybe she thought that she was untouchable because of who her family was, but then this event of her being kidnapped actually opened her eyes to the true power that the cartels could wield over almost anyone in Mexico. Maybe she realized that the cartel wouldn't let her go. I'm not really sure what happened, but after this kidnapping, she ended her studies and actually decided to go ahead and enter the trap 
business. The business of drug trafficking is said to be dominated by men, and most women who see what goes on behind closed doors with the most powerful of cartel leaders are really only there to serve one specific purpose. Sandra was one of the rare exceptions. Being a woman in that world, she saw that she had to work a lot harder than the men did in order to earn the respect of the cartel leaders, but she was determined that she was going to do it. She was really careful to never use the white powder that she peddled herself because she said, if you do it, the men think you are just another disposable woman. You won't be respected, she said. Women in this world, she explained, are abused, discarded, and tossed out with little more concern than a child abandoning a Barbie doll. Narco leaders would often keep a harem of up to 10 women, and Sandra told The Guardian in 2016, women are looked at as objects, ornaments, or a necessity, but never as a fighting being or a person made of triumphs and achievements. Sandra used her good looks and charms, as well as her excellent driving and sharpshooting skills, to help establish herself among the powerful men at the highest level of Mexico's underworld. Sandra quickly became a socialite and made many connections there. She even won a shooting competition against the top bodyguard of one of the cartel leaders. Her life became full-time cartel and she was a fast learner so she quickly moved through the ranks and she was coveted by men every step of the way. Sandra was a beautiful young woman and she admits to using her flirting skills to get ahead in the business. She said she once had a suitor who brought her a pickup truck as a gift. He left at her friend's house with flowers and a note and when she opened the note it said spend the money on a trip that you want and there inside the envelope was a hundred thousand dollars. I need to find a way to make that kind of money without doing something illegal or immoral. I'm just saying. When Sandra was 21 years old, she started dating the boss of the Juarez cartel, Armando Fuentes, and his nickname was the Lord of the Skies. At that time, her job for the cartel was to oversee illegal substance shipments that were going into the U.S. And while Sandra's relationship with Armando didn't seem to last long, it's said that she went on to have affairs with several well-known barons and she was married several times. Her marriages appeared to have been more tactical than romantic as two of her husbands were ex-police commanders turned traffickers. Because her husbands knew the ins and outs of the Mexican police world, they were able to share these insights with Sandra and this actually helped her to dodge the police at every turn. The advantages that Sandra gained from these marriages seemed to be the one thing that allowed her to rise even higher in the ranks and become a huge figure in substance smuggling. She seemed to fully embrace the decadent lifestyle of a cartel leader as she raked in untold millions and she used some of her money to buy things like 30 cars and she bought herself a gold pendant that had 83 rubies, 228 diamonds, and 189 sapphires on it. But of course all of this power and glamour that comes with the life of being a powerful cartel leader also comes with a lot of danger and violence. Sandra's brother was her to death and both of her husbands ended up dying at the hands of hired assassins. Sandra herself had been able to stay mostly in the shadows until a band came out and wrote a song about her and they basically out her to the entire world. So she was furious because her cover had just been blown by a band and just a few months later Sandra was ambushed in the street by rivals and just barely escaped with her life. Sandra continued to date powerful men and was even rumored to have been with El Chapo himself at one point, which no one seems to know the full extent of their relationship, but they were apparently really close friends and Sandra went on to become the head of public relations for the Sinaloa cartel. Gaining respect was one of the most important things to Sandra. She didn't want to be just invited to the party. She was determined that she was going to become the queen of coke and in less than 10 years she had risen to basically that level of success within the organization. Sandra then starts dating a man Man named Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, or the Tiger, as he was nicknamed. He had strong connections to another cartel in Colombia, and Sandra actually was able to use this to her advantage. And with this relationship, authorities say she was able to unite the Mexican and Colombian cartels. So now, because of this strategic relationship, Sandra's now making more money for Sinaloa than ever before, and really starting to show off her luxury lifestyle with 15 homes, 30 sports cars, and just just hundreds and hundreds of jewels. She definitely fit the Hollywood portrayal of 
the drug lord life. Apparently through his organization, the tiger was transporting more than 10 tons of white snow per month on tuna fishing boats. And in 2001, authorities seized a tuna fishing boat that had more than nine tons of white powder on board. Man, I wonder how long they were bringing 10 tons a month in before authorities finally caught on to them. So even though that 2001 shipment had somehow kind of been loosely linked to Sandra and her boyfriend Ramirez the tiger, there was no direct evidence that was actually allowing them to connect it and go ahead and arrest either one of them. But because of this incident, Sandra was dubbed the queen of the Pacific by the media. Despite her high profile lifestyle, Sandra avoided leaving the police any real evidence to pin anything on her for many years. That is until 2002, when her son was kidnapped and held for a $5 million US dollar ransom. When Sandra was able to quickly pay this $5 million ransom, the Mexican police really started to take a closer look at Sandra and what she was doing. The fact that she had this much money and she was like, here you go. They're like, "Mm, something fishy's going on here. So it wasn't long after they started looking into her that Sandra landed herself on the authorities most wanted list and she was forced to live her life on the run. Sandra spent more than five years as a fugitive and she described the years as very tiring. No, no descansas. Estás, estás cambiándote constantemente de, de ciudad, de casa. No puedes tener amistades. No puedes ver a tu familia. Es, es agobiante. It was so hard to have to constantly be changing houses, your hair color, and even trying to change your voice like all the time. But she also remembered the thrill of these experiences. And she said, adrenaline is a drug, an addiction. There are people who like to feel adrenaline, some with heights, others with guns, and women who feel adrenaline when they cheat on their husband. That is adrenaline, the sin that maybe you will get caught. Well, Sandra Avila Beltran finally did get caught. It took 30 agents four years to build their case, but they were finally able to arrest Sandra and Ramirez. At this point, the Mexican government still couldn't pin any charges on her. So Sandra was actually charged and quickly convicted of laundering money for billions of dollars worth of drugs that were smuggled from Colombia into Mexico. After the exhaustion of being on the run for so long, Sandra says that neither she nor Ramirez even tried to escape. She said when she heard the arresting officers call her name, all she felt was relief. Fue un alivio ser detenida, no regresar a ser santa, a ser detenida, a ya no huir. However, when Sandra was arrested, she continued to deny the allegations. And in a tape of her police interrogation, Sandra describes herself as a housewife who earns a little money on the side selling clothes and renting houses. Sandra was sent to a women's prison in Mexico City, but prison life for a wealthy cartel leader is slightly different than that of your average inmate. As Sandra put it, money buys everything in Mexico. Thanks to the infamously corrupt system, Sandra was able to continue her lavish lifestyle even behind bars. She was able to welcome visitors into her cell. She was decked out in bejeweled high heels, jewelries, wearing designer clothes. She even had three maids who would actually usher in the guests like they were her doorman or something and then serve food and alcohol and even bring them cigarettes. And even with all of that, I mean, obviously, Other prisoners don't, if you guys didn't know, other prisoners don't get that, right? Like that's not a normal thing. However, even with all of that, prison life was apparently not up to her normal standards. And she filed a complaint with the Mexico City Human Rights Commission saying that her cell had insects, which she referred to as noxious fauna. And she also complained that the prison wouldn't let her bring in a restaurant, prepare food. And she said this violated her human rights. Now the bugs, I get, but what did she expect? The four seasons? Like you're in prison in Mexico. Like what a brat. Then in January, 2011, she made headlines again when Mexican authorities said they were investigating a tip that she had received Botox treatments in prison. You guys, I just can't even with this girl. I mean, clearly she knows money apparently does buy everything. And it wasn't even like some shady syringe being smuggled in, right? No, 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 no. They brought in a trained professional, an actual doctor into the prison to inject her with Botox. Nothing but the best for the queen of the Pacific. But I guess that explains her being so upset over the restaurant prepared things. I mean, if you're gonna bring in a doctor to give her Botox, restaurant food doesn't seem too big a ask. Especially when she has her own maids who are going to run out and get it for her and bring it to her. (laughs) 
crazy. After the investigation over the Botox thing, both the prison's director and the hospital chief were relieved of their duties. I'm thinking, okay, did they threaten these guys or did they bribe them? I kind of hope they bribed them since they ended up losing their job over it. Hope it was a big bribe. I couldn't find much detail as to how or why, but early 2011, all of the drug charges against Sandra were dropped. I'm guessing maybe lack of evidence, that would be my guess. However, she did remain jailed while the Mexican courts decided if they were going to grant an extradition request from the US. The US was interested in her in regards to several hundred pounds of white snow that had been seized by authorities in Chicago way back in 2001. And there was also a 2004 indictment in Florida that alleged that Sandra was involved in a drug dealing case there. Now, U.S. officials had sent extradition requests for Sandra several times in the past, but they had all been previously denied. However, in 2012, the request was granted by Mexican authorities and Sandra was sent to the U.S. to face the music there. But in 2013, Sandra was able to get herself a plea deal in Miami. She pled guilty to a lesser charge of being an accessory after the fact by admitting that she had provided Ramirez with financial assistance for travel, lodging, and other expenses from 2002 to 2004. Now, at first I was thinking maybe she flipped on her boyfriend and that's how she got this deal, but Ramirez had actually already pled guilty back in 2009. So I'm not really sure what the authorities got out of this plea deal, but do y'all want to know? Do y'all want to guess what she got out of this plea deal after all that drama? Time served, y'all. They gave her time served based on the time that she had spent in a Mexican prison. When I heard she would go down to Florida, I was like, mm, man, she's about to get handed to her. They are ruthless down in them Florida courts, or so they say. But nope, not little Miss Queen of the Ocean. She was released and deported back to Mexico. When she got back to Mexico on August 20th, 2013, she was immediately arrested again on money laundering charges. At this point, she's probably like, really, you guys? Like, could we not just do all of this at one time? Really? So she's convicted by the Mexican courts in 2013 and she's given a fine and she's sentenced to five years in prison. But then in 2015, she's released. I don't know if you guys can count or not, but 2013 to 2015, that's not five years. She was probably costing them too much money with all her maids and caviar. So throughout all of this, Sandra had actually spent about seven years in prison, but two of those years were actually in isolation. So that part does sound brutal. Like that's legit torture to be in isolation. However, even in that situation, it sounds like Sandra turned lemons into lemonade. Sandra said she learned to survive those two years of solitary confinement by reviving her journalist dreams. She would sit in her prison cell and listen to the radio and then pretend to be a newscaster who was reporting on world events. She covered presidential elections in Venezuela and two elections in the U.S. She said she would listen to the newscast and then she would make predictions about the results. I mean, I have to admit, that's a pretty smart way to not go crazy in solitary confinement. So are you guys curious what our little queen of the ocean's been up to since she was released in 2015? Well, Sandra is now 62 years old. She resides in Guadalajara and she's a TikTok star. Apparently, she's been showing off her luxury lifestyle all over TikTok. So I don't have TikTok, but I tried to watch some of her videos and I don't speak Spanish. So that research didn't go very far, but I did notice she has over 200,000 followers on there. Sandra's exact network is difficult to pinpoint because most of her wealth, you know, her 15 houses and 30 cars and hundreds of jewels and all that, it's been under litigation since her arrest and release from prison in 2015. And as of late 2022, that legal battle is still ongoing. However, just based off of the lavish lifestyle that she flaunts all over social media, the website Idol Net Worth has estimated her wealth to be around 50 million. But the queen of the Pacific clearly wants more. Sandra has currently been in the news because she is now suing Netflix and Telemundo trying to get 40% of their total revenue for the show Queen of the South. In legal documents, she accuses the two media giants of using her image without her consent for their game. So if you haven't seen this show, there was a Spanish version that came out first in 2011, La Reina de Sur, which means Queen of the South. And that show was so 
successful that they actually made a English version by the same name, but of course in English, Queen of the South. So if you're from America, that might be the show you're thinking of when I say that. But the lawsuit is actually directly related to the original Spanish speaking version of the show. That original show was actually written off of a book by the same name. And I saw two articles stating that the author of that book has previously admitted that the story of his heroine, Teresa Mendoza, is partly based on Sandra Avila Beltran's life, just with some fictionalized characters and events added in. But then I found another article that claims he's currently denying it and saying that the Queen of the South is a fictional character created through visits and conversations with many different kinds of drug traffickers. So either he admitted it or he didn't. I hope that was helpful for you guys. Now you might be thinking, okay, so what? Public figures have shows made about them all the time without their consent. Does she really have any right to this money? Well, that's basically the stance that Netflix is taking on it. And they're saying like, she's a public figure. She's accused of a crime. And so talking about her is not an invasion of her privacy. It's a matter of public interest and it falls under journalism laws basically, which I'm not sure what the laws in Mexico are about journalism, but that would sometimes be the case here in the US just depending on the situation. So apparently this is kind of a legal gray area and it would really be hard for Sandra to prove that she is the one that the show's about because there's obviously other women, you know, maybe not a lot, but there are other women who've lived similar lifestyles to her. And I have some videos on that. If you guys are interested, go check them out. So typically it would be really hard to prove, okay, this is definitely about her and not one of the other people. But what I think might actually get them is that in April of 2019, Telemundo actually used real news footage from Sandra's arrest to promote the series second season. And then the broadcast included footage of Sandra right alongside the actress who plays Teresa Mendoza. And they insinuated a link between them. The reporter even went on to say that Sandra was the niece of the godfather of whatever drug stuff. And allegedly she was a go-between for the Sinaloa cartel and the Colombian cocaine traffickers. And at the end said, Sandra was the muse for the series. Like you're gonna put all of that in your advertising for the show and then try to deny it's not on her. Like, mm, she might have them there. In her letter to Mexico's Institute of Industrial Property, Sandra wrote, both companies acted wrongfully with the intention of harming my image and making money out of it. When they used my image and my name to refer to the Queen of the South, they sought to increase the morbid curiosity of the public and to obtain a financial benefit from it. Her lawyers are basically saying that she was never convicted of these crimes and now she's being portrayed as having done all of this. And so that can definitely damage someone's reputation, basically. If nothing else, she might have a defamation lawsuit, which again, like I said, I don't know how the court systems work in Mexico but that would probably for sure be a defamation trial here in the US. So obviously there's a lot more going on with that legal stuff and I'll have links down below if anybody's interested in more of that. But if Sandra were to win this case, it would mean a multi-million dollar payout. And I bet that would change a lot of things for the way that Netflix portrays real life characters. I don't know, maybe they don't care. Maybe they have enough money, they don't care. I don't know. But apparently there's been a couple of other things lately in the news and Netflix Narcos franchise is facing lawsuits as well. So that's gonna be pretty interesting to follow. So in an interview, Sandra was asked what single measure would she take if she were the president of Mexico and was interested in eradicating drug violence. Sandra's response was that first, you have to attack poverty. Poverty is what causes violence. You start to be a delinquent and then you become violent. Sandra doesn't seem to have any remorse for any of her part in the drug trade. And Sandra insists that the drug trade is basically no different than alcohol. And she compares drug cartel violence to the prohibition in America. Sandra has said that narco trafficking is a business that has not been legalized. It's a business like alcohol. During prohibition in those days, an alcohol salesman was considered a bad person. But when it became legalized, people who sold it became respectable. And Sandra said, well, I don't see that alcohol or tobacco salesmen feel guilty. You go to a restaurant and a bar and the owners don't feel guilty. Cambiaría nunca haber conocido a los colombianos. Eso fueron los que me de ahí de ese problema fue los que me separó de mi hijo y es lo único que me arrepiento o que me duele. Yo culpable no porque nunca le he hecho yo daño a nadie. Remordimiento tampoco porque yo no he hecho nunca mal. Dolor sí, porque he perdido muchos amigos. Sandra's position is simple. She insists that each individual is free to partake in the drug 
drug world or abstain and that no one is obligated to use. Now, I'm definitely not an expert like she is, but I think I'd have to disagree with that because there have been lots of cases where people were forced to do things against their will in these kind of situations. And Sandra continues to blame a lot of the violence on government corruption, which I'm not going to disagree with that one. Mexico mucha corrupción, pero no es nomás con el narcotráfico, hay mucha corrupción en cualquier ámbito social, comercio, empresas, tráfico de influencias con el narcotráfico, con indocumentados, con en todo. Sandra's relationship to the drug world now seems to be just an outsider who's not playing the game anymore, but she seems perfectly happy to maintain all of her connections and relationships in that world while even not being a part of it. And she seems mostly content to just enjoy her life, making up for lost times with her adult son. In her interviews, Sandra also noted that people still call her Rena or Queen in the street, and she smiles at her notoriety. So now she's not running from the cops, seems like she does enjoy the attention. So what do you guys think of this one? Have you guys ever heard of Sandra before? Do you guys think she's gonna win this lawsuit with Netflix? Do you think that the rumors about her life are true? And what do you guys think about her being on TikTok now? <laughs> Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, check out these videos right here.